always on time, and I am not. So, as you pray for him, pray for me, that I will, uh, I will learn. There was a mysterious blue envelope going around last week. If you didn't get one last week, you can grab one this week. Uh, I, I will be the holder of these, so you'll have to come see me to get it so that I can register that you have it. So if you would, just uh, see me and I'll make sure you get one of those plain, ordinary blue envelopes with a, with a letter inside. People continue to come in. There are still some more Advent materials that are out on the kiosk out there across from the Welcome Center. Um, go ahead and grab some of those and you don't have to use them this year. There'll be some good tools in there for this year. It's never too late to focus on the Lord, to draw close to the Lord, to take in His Word. So there's several resources there that have been provided. We're grateful and make sure that those disappear. If you're a guest with us this morning, there's some things at the Welcome Center, which is right outside these doors. There's some crosses and some plaques and things that we encourage you to take with you. And they're, they're gifts of a sort, but really we ask that you take those and you remember us in your prayers as we remember you as you look for a place of worship, service, and giving. So there's some things that are out there at the, uh, at the welcome desk. I'm grateful for the response that we've received to the giving tree. That's the, that's the, uh, the tree with the envelopes on it. And those monies all go for the benevolence uh, throughout the year. And so as you guys have been giving to that, we're grateful. Uh, and, and we've really gone over and above that because there's many needs that we've been meeting over through the month of December that doesn't come out of that money from that tree. So for your time that's been given, for the prayers that you have prayed, for the service and the ministry that you have performed to our, within our community, um, I am grateful and, and the body is grateful. And I'll go on to say, if you know anyone in your neighborhood, if you know anybody at work, if, if you know anybody in your community that has a need, please make sure that you see me and we'll look into that and see what resources are available to meet those needs. And it doesn't have to be simply a financial need. It could be a, a need of another time. So ask the Lord. What needs are going on around me? And they're all around us, folks, that, that we're not aware of. Ask the Spirit to make us sensitive to that. First, that you might need it. Right? Don't run to the church right off the bat. And say, Lord, have you equipped me to do this? Uh, and so ask that question and, and trust the Lord will work in you and through you for always for His glory, not for the sake of the church. We don't promote it uh, in that light. It's going to be an, an intimate time this morning. Thank you for making worship uh, on Christmas Eve a priority. Um, I didn't pray for a certain number to be here, but this is, this is more than, than I had expected. So Lord bless you for your faithful obedience uh, to Him as we come together to worship. And I'm also going to ask is, after we sing our first two songs, if some people on the way wings could swing in a little bit, it may allow me to preach down here rather than up there this morning uh, when it comes time to, to um, look into God's Word. We have a responsive reading this morning. You'll have to pay attention so that you'll know when you read and when I read. So it comes from the hymnal. I think it's number 12 in the hymnal if you want to follow there. But uh, if you can read at the beginning of each uh, reading, it'll, it'll let you know who's, who is to read. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the, the whole empire should be registered. The first registration took place while Quirinius was the governing in Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. And you would read, and Joseph,
in the same region there were shepherds. And they were staying out in the fields and they were keeping watch over their flock. But then an angel, an angel of the Lord be appeared before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news, of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, a seer who is Christ, right, was born for you in the city of David. Suddenly, there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to people he favors. That may not be the translation that you've memorized that you wanted to blurt out, but that's the translation that we have in our, in our reading. May the Lord always, at his blessing, uh, to the hearing and the reading, the, the recitation and the doing of, of His Word. If the worship team would come now, they will lead us, and then we'll let the children go after the second song before we light the Advent candle. Stand with us as we worship in song this morning. Silently, how 
silently the wondrous gift is given so God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his love no ear may hear his coming but in this world of sin where meek souls shall receive him still the dear Christ enters in dismissed. You good, Carolyn? You got it? Jamie's going in. Blind will see 
the deaf will hear, the dead will live again, the lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? And this sleep child you're holding is the great I am. Oh, Mary, did you know Now, for those of you who are worried right now and concerned that we forgot to light the Advent candle, we didn't, okay? So, even if you would come forward, now you can breathe the, your sigh, sigh of relief that we've uh, not forgotten. And I'll use this right here. You need this? You want it? No. Yeah. No? <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. I do. How about red, Steve? This is Eva Troutman. Good morning, everyone. As we begin our Christmas celebration, celebrating Jesus' birth, we light the final candle of the Advent wreath. First, we lit the candle for hope, because Jesus is our hope. Second, we lit the candle for peace, because Jesus is our hope and peace. Third, we lit the candle for joy, because Jesus brings joy. And fourth, the candle for love, because Jesus is love. Today, we light the center candle. This is the Christ candle. Jesus is born. Jesus has come. Jesus is our salvation. Amen. Here are a few scripture readings. The first is from Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law. The second is Isaiah 9, 2-7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. <coughs> you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you, according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide spoils. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian, for every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood. Will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son Glory. is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, 
there will be no end. Glory. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And the third is Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Amen. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, mm. who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That's great, good news. Would you, uh, would you bow and pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for this, uh, this holy season, and we recognize that Christmas is just around the corner. Uh, but we would ask by way of this prayer that you would, you would renew our, our focus, O oh God, and that this Christmas would not be a, a lost opportunity. And so as we gather with friends and family, help us to, to make the most of this occasion by commending and focusing on and celebrating your son. He is the, the great gift of Christmas. And so, Father, we thank you that you gave your own son to, to dwell among us and to die for us. And that you, you raised him. And we, we confess there would be no salvation and no true comfort or joy apart from your living son. So with hearts deep with gratitude and thanksgiving this morning, we thank you and we pray this prayer in your name. Amen. Good right there, guys. We good? This morning I'm going to read a, several uh, verses of Scripture, but we're only going to focus on one. It'll be uh, maybe a 20-minute sermon thereabout. Um, We'll look at some truth from really one verse of Scripture. We're going to turn to the, to the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your digital devices or your Bibles, there are some Bibles in the seats there close by. Um, and you may be able to find that. Most all of us are very familiar, as we've already read from the, the Gospel of Luke, with the account of the, uh, the birth of Jesus in chapter 2, there is one verse that's repeated twice, very close to one another, but you don't find this verse in any of the other Gospels. And so that's the, one, that's the verse that we're going to look at that we've already looked at a couple of times in our reading this morning. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read 1 through 12, but we're only going to look at verse 12 uh, as a message this morning, titled, A Sign for the Times. This is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. That wasn't a coincidence. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own town, his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. That is not a coincidence. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child, that's not a coincidence. And so it was, while they were there, the days were complete for her to be delivered. She's going to have this 
child. And that was no coincidence. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger or a trough because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, the angels are going to be apart, and there were in the same country shepherds driving out the, uh, dr- d- living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord showed around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this sign that we're going to look at is is not a coincidence. It is a sign to you that you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, cloths and lying in a manger and it's from that scripture that we will look at uh, a sign for the times this morning what's amazing about this to me as i've done my study for this is is how ordinary everything is ordinary signs that god chose to mark the coming in the flesh His coming to earth. Think of how you might have done it. Maybe it's even impossible to even think along that. Well, there's a baby, and there's swaddling cloths, and there's a trough. Now, would any of those have been a highlight in the story as you would have written it? Jesus, the Jews wanted a sign, and they got one. And it was a clear sign, and they missed it. But sadly... People still miss it today. They still miss it today. So on this Christmas Eve morning, we're going to look closely at this small part of the Christmas miracle, the the wonder of it, the the beauty of it, the story of it, the truth of it. And doing that, I, I hope, I trust, and I pray It'll help us see this story, maybe in a a little different light, because we normally just gloss over this one verse because of its simplicity. Well, because of its humanity, because of its humility, we just gloss right over it. So let's begin. It says, you will find a baby. There's no secret Greek words there. There's no way to parse that and translate it. There's nothing hidden there. That's what it means. You're going to find a baby. That was the sign. An infant. A newborn. We all know what one feels like. Probably all of us have held one. And, and, and so that's, it's well, it's, it's ordinary. You know, I, I guess I'll reveal the obvious. Christ came the way we all do. That's pretty ordinary. That may not have been the way you would have scripted it, but that's the way God scripted it. Now, I will say this. There was a wonder and a miracle nine months earlier, Amen. right? In the conception, there was, that's where the miracle took place. The, the birth was just like ours. It was commonplace and it was or, ordinary. But we know by way of Scripture that, that the Holy Spirit did a, a unique work uh, for, for Mary to become pregnant with the, the Christ child. So there was wonder and miracle, but it just came nine months earlier. So what does that reveal to us? Well, if, if, we'll be, if we'll simplify, allow this verse just to speak as it does, it, re- it reveals the hu- humanity, Christ's humanity, His God becoming flesh and among us. Christ was completely and fully God from eternity, okay? Let's, 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 let's stabilize some theology and some truth here before we go much farther. The second person of the Godhead, the Son of God, was conceived uniquely by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. But he was born in a stable in Bethlehem. So we see, let me me be clear, Jesus is not half God and half man. Jesus is totally, completely, and fully God, and he is totally, completely fully man. He's not 
50. He's 100% God and he's 100% man, though he did not sin. And the scriptures tell us that he willingly laid aside his outward glory of his deity and his coming. You see, God knew our greatest need, and he, he stepped into human history to provide what we could not provide for ourselves, hope. Salvation. Redemption, reconciliation. See, Christ had to be born in order to die for our sins and be resurrected to give us that resurrection power. Colossians 2.9 says it this way. It says, for in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Leave that there for a moment. A few words, but so rich and so deep in truth and application. For in him Christ dwells the fullness, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For you will find a baby. A baby. God comes to earth as, as this tiny helpless baby to save us and to atone for our sins. So we see his hum humanity. The scripture goes on in verse 12, says, And you will find this babe, you will find this babe wrapped in swaddling cloths. I don't know what that looks like to you. Maybe you've seen too many movies. You've seen too many uh, things on TV. Technology and Hollywood has changed this. But I don't know how you see and picture this, Christ being wrapped in swaddling cloths. But let me give you just a little bit of history. In Christ's day and, and, and centuries after that, it was common, it was custom not to just diaper a baby. They did what's called, they swaddled. And so what they did was, is they took cloths and they would wrap the baby's arm. And then they would wrap the baby's other arm in cloth. And then they would wrap each of the legs in cloth. And then they would wrap those together and they would bind them or they would swaddle an infant. Even their torso. And you think, well that's kind of wild. It's not cruel. It's not cruel at all. You see, it was, it was wise medical care of the time, and it was a caution at the time because the mortality rate was so high. It said that half of the children that were born of this time didn't live to see the age of 10. And so they were being careful. They were not being cruel in swaddling the infant. But so what's the big deal? What does this demonstrate? What does it reveal? Well, it, it reminds us all of the later time in Jesus' life when he would be bound hand and foot and he would be brought before the authorities. It also reminds us when, after his crucifixion, he was wrapped and he was bound in the grave clothes and put in Arimath Joseph of Arimathea's tomb only to leave that binding behind. It was no coincidence that he, he entered the world the way he left it. To me, that was a very profound thought, that if we understand how he entered, um, it's no surprise how he left it. He left it, it bound he came not for the faith of a few, but to be the Savior of all. And he was bound that we might be what? That we might be set free. What a glorious picture. What a beautiful picture. As we see what some have called his helplessness. And then the scriptures go on to say that he what? He was lying in a manger. Significance there. He was lying in a borrowed manger. And this one that we have up here, this trough that we have up here, is probably a Cadillac compared to what Christ would have, have used in that stable. And once again, TV and movies and technology has, has really clouded over or shrouded the real intent here as we see the humility of being placed in a feeding trough, one that's not even their own, um, that only the animals would have, have used. 
the simplicity of his surroundings. It also reveals his humility that he that that's how 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 he came. Think about it. He was born far from home. All right, in a city that they hadn't been to. Mary and Joseph had not been to, though it was their their homeland. The scriptures tell us that he, as he grew, that he had no place to lay his head. So he was a, a man without a, a home. We all know that he was stripped naked and he was crucified on a cross. We see this humility. You see, the truth is, in this humility, he, God's ordained son was a sign to us all. A sign to us all. That God came to us and he came for us in a most unlikely and a humble way. Once again, this is not the way we would have scripted it. Philippians 2.7 says this of his humility. But he made himself of no reputation. No reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. The God of glory you see, nothing about his outward appearances, nothing about his, his outward circumstances pointed to a God. The Jews missed it, and many others have since. Yet it was a clear sign to us. The angel said, and, you will, you, and this will be your sign. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Isaiah 55, 9, it's timely here. It says, the heavens are higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. Leave that there for a moment. What does that mean? I don't mean what does it mean to you. Not what does it mean to you. What does it mean that God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts? It must have seen, well, his just ways are beyond finding out. Well, the scripture says that, but all his ways are not beyond finding out, folks. I tell you what, what, in what ways God's ways are higher than ours in, in his grace. His grace is, is infinitely higher than ours. His mercy, his mercy is infinitely higher than ours. It's, it's immeasurable. His goodness, his patience is higher than ours and that's why we run to him so we run to him when we understand his character his forgiveness is higher than ours and his thoughts are higher so what does what's in that for us we're way down here and god's way up here here's what it says it says that we ought to run to him it, it, realizing he is so much more we we should we should press into him to discern and see his character. And we should allow that to be a training ground for us in righteousness and holiness and grace and mercy. And so when we realize he is all of that, it should, it should draw us to him and, 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 and want us, or, des, or we should desire to press into him. Romans 11.33 says much the same thing. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. Not just one, but the wisdom and the knowledge. How unsearchable are your judgments, and His ways are past finding out. Many of His ways are. But look, He's revealed many of them to us. Are you still discovering the beauties and the glories of Christ? By way of circumstancing and living and doing His will, do we encounter Him and, and, and allow him to reveal to us things that, that we had never seen or experienced before. We, we see that on every page of the New Testament. And so this morning on Christmas Eve, from this simple verse, there will be a sign to you. There is a sign to you and it's clear. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. May we never skip over this and just fly through this in the future. Here's more truth. Every, every Sunday and even this Saturday morning service, there are those who get it. There are those who are receiving it. There are those who are embracing it. 
There are those who a light is dawning. You're saying, you know what? I've not seen this before. And, and we're grateful and we're thankful and we're praised. We're full of praise for, for how we see this sign that we may have just glossed over before. There are those who get it and receive it. They see the truth. They understand the truth. They embrace the truth. And they allow that, that light to guide them. But at the same time, there's those who, who don't get it. And they don't embrace it. And they don't see it. And they don't understand it because they're still in the dark. They're in the dark. You see, faith is a, a gift from God. And Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 tells us that. For by grace you're saved through faith. It's a gift of God. It's not a result of works, lest any man should, should boast. So see, without faith, we see it's impossible to see God. Without pay, faith, it's impossible to know God, and it's impossible to understand God. You, could, you can hear a thousand sermons. You can go listen to 500 cantatas. You could go to just about every blog and website that there is. You can go to beauty, you could go to, to Christmas pageants and, and never come to Christ. It's about more than information. So the un, unsaved heart is blind and can't see the gospel until God opens the eyes of the heart and he removes the blindness, much as he did for. Saul, who became Paul on that Damascus road. So the, so the question is, how did and how does such a, a simple Scripture, with such humble beginnings, in such a remote place, how, how did that bring such wonder into the world? How, how, did that, how has that transformed the world and is still transforming the world? How is it that a scripture like this, so ordinary, so simple, could turn disaster, disaster into delight? And it's because God did what we could never do, and He did it in a way which we would never do it. He opened the door of heaven and life eternal for all of us to be, re, be forgiven of sin and be reconciled to, a, reconciled to a holy God. As part of my research for the message, I came across a, a close. And this comes from uh, Charles Spurgeon's sermon on this very verse um, among his sermons. And so allow me to close as Spurgeon did uh, when he preached this sermon. This scene, he writes, or he says, at Bethlehem is one of utter simplicity. We have a mother, we have a father, and we have a baby. And thus, in this way, the Word made flesh to dwell among us. But what God does is both simple and clear. And the message to us is also simple and clear. To those who come in simple faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, find great peace. And we need once again to preach the plain man's gospel, free of speculation and centered on Christ. And Spurgeon then urged his hearers to come in faith to the babe of Bethlehem who would one day die for the sins of the entire world. Spurgeon says, little children should come for he was once a little child himself. Oh, young women should come, for Mary was a young woman who was God's instrument for bringing Christ into the world. And yes, young men should come, for Joseph was a young man who had great faith in God. Older women should come, for Anna was an old woman who looked for the coming of the Lord. And old men should come, for aged Simeon waited for the consolation of all of Israel. And the working men and the working women should come to Christ because the shepherds represent all those who work with their hands for a living. And they too came to Bethlehem. Finally, the highly educated of the world should come for the wise men bearing gifts. They too bowed and worshipped 
the king. Here is Spurgeon's closing appeal. And I close as he does. He says, for my own part, the incarnate God is, is all my hope and trust. I come back to preach by God's help the gospel, the simple gospel of the Son of God. Jesus, Master, he prays, I take thee to be mine forever. May all in this house be led to do the same. And may they all be thine, O great Son of God, in the day of your appearing. For all thy love's sake. Amen. And the one who writes these words says the same thing. Jesus, Master, I take thee to be mine forever. And I pray that everyone who reads this sermon and hears these words may be led of the Spirit to do the very same thing. May we all come in saving faith to the Lord Jesus Christ and worship Him both now and forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this simple text, but yet it's, it's profound truth. And so, Lord, as we, are, as we are caught up in it yet again, we thank you for the gospel message. We, we thank you for coming. Father, we acknowledge that you are going to come again and so lord i pray for for those who might be here this morning who aren't prepared for your coming who've been in the dark until now but 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 now because of the spirit's work this morning they cannot say i'm still in the dark i still don't know i still don't understand draw this even this morning to yourself O oh god that none would leave here this morning estranged from you separated from you far from you with the wrath of God still upon them. So draw them to yourself, O oh God. We thank you how you have shown us the light, O oh God, and redeemed us through the glorious gospel. So as we continue to sing and reflect on the truth that your Spirit's impressing upon us, O oh God, may we be doers of the word and not hearers only. And that's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us as we continue to sing. You may be very familiar with some of the last couple of songs we do, and you may not be as familiar, but that's okay. We'll learn as we go. Let's sing away in a manger.
Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed the Savior's birth. Go, go tell it on the mountain, over and everywhere go go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born down in a lowly manger the humble Christ was born and brought salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go, go, tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go, go, tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Go, go, tell it on the mountain mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Our benediction comes from Colossians 1, well if my phone will operate, uh, Colossians 1, uh, 19 through 20. For in him, that is in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And so we come to celebrate this season now. And we recognize, we celebrate the birth of Jesus because it is God initiating his rescue plan for a fallen humanity. And it was a birth and it was a son that we received that we did not deserve. And at the birth of Jesus, all the promises of thousands of years, starting with the first one to Eve, that there would come one, a second Adam, who was better than the first Adam, who would not fail to cast out the serpent that would succeed, all those promises came true on the morning of that birth. And then you could, in a sense, when you read through Scripture, you can wait with bated breath at the birth of Jesus, and you're thinking, how is he going to enact this rescue plan? Like, what is this going to look like? Because in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So would it be through fire and through judgment? Would he raise to be the king of Israel and cast out the Gentiles who were called dogs and, and sweep over this earth in warfare and bloodshed and do the things that we deserve to receive from him? And the answer is no. Because God is mercy and God is justice. God is good and God will not practice that goodness at the expense of his justice. But Jesus does it all. And he took upon himself what we deserved. So we celebrate many things at the birth of Jesus, not the least of which is that God is good and merciful and gracious towards sinners. So let's come together this morning and let's pray and thank him. Lord God, thank you that at the birth of Jesus, we did not receive from your hand the thing that we deserved. We received from you the thing that we did not deserve, which is yourself. Lord, you did the unthinkable. You became a man. You entered into the fallen creation, and you shared in our brokenness, in our pains, and in our suffering, so that you would be a good and faithful high priest who knows the suffering of his brothers. Lord God, you have proven yourself again and again to us. Not that you needed to. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your humility to come to this world not with trumpets and fanfare and a ripping open of the heavens, but as a child and to be laid in the manger and to be wrapped in child form, Lord. Lord God, we thank you. And we praise you this morning. We thank you for your son, the greatest gift that you could give us. So we praise you and we ask you for grace that we would come to know Jesus 
to come to know his birth and his life and his works in our place, to come to know his cross and the power of his resurrection in such a way that we be forever transformed by it. And we ask it in Christ's name for our good and that you might be glorified in us. And amen.